welcome to my channel. Emily here to discuss literature with you. And today we're going to talk about the art of war. I'm going to talk a little bit about it and I'm going to read from it so you can hear some of the brilliance in this text. This here is my uh, Barnes & Noble leather pocketbook from a series of all the Barnes & Noble leather pocketbook collection I have, which I'm going to go ahead and film in a separate video and show you my series. But for now, we're going to talk a little bit about the art of war. Um, there are many other good versions of this text. I have a traditional Amazon version, which I've written all up in. I also have a Barnes & Noble Classics version for my Barnes & Noble Classics um, paperbound collection, which I've showed many of those, which are these. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the art of war. Um, by the way, I love my leather editions. They're so pretty. So the art of war is written by Sun Tzu. It is, um, a text that was created around the fifth century by a Chinese military general, supposedly. Um, it is composed of 13 chapters. It is a book that, a text that was, used for about a thousand years, at least after that, by other Chinese emperors and generals as their main strategy guide. It is known as one of the most influential strategy guides on military warfare ever written, ever, really, but at least for um, many, many years, especially the most influential uh, text in Asian culture and Asian literature in Asian warfare, um, the art of war. And obviously it's translated. <laughs> there are many different, I think, different translations. I think in the 1700s, it was translated by a German man whose name I can't remember, which might be the most modern version that we get um, when we read The Art of War. Um, anyway, each chapter in The Art of War is a different set of skills so and teaches a different thing. And they're, they are written in little quips, almost like bullet points to kind of study and memorize. So um, uh, Colin Powell has said he always keeps a copy of this near where he works for political strategy. And General MacArthur, MacArthur said he always kept it on his desk for when planning um, military action. So even in mo this modern day and age, it's used as instructional material by the Marine Corps um, for students at West Point. And it's also made its influence into other countries, into military strategy as well. And ironically, it is it can also be sort of used as, as metaphorically for the battle of the minds, you know, like uh, winning a battle against your spouse or your coworker or um, modern day political debate um, as far as how to uh, how to win over the psychological and the physical, um, uh, you know, some kind of contest or conflict with your opponent using being more brilliant than your opponent is really what it comes down to. So I'm going to read to you on my notes, the different um, chapters we'll read actually from the index, but basically the book is broken down into teaching about weapons, environmental conditions, espionage, rank and discipline, strategy on and off the battlefield. This includes planning for battle, not just once you get to battle. Um, and then we have separately um, attack planning, military planning, and um, rank and discipline, understanding, and uh, soldier etiquette and behavior. Basically all operations of military tactic and so um, before I read from it, I do want to say that there's a whole long history of the art of war being used in movies and television um, and referred to. There's an actual spinoff, there's an actual movie, The Art of War, and that was, and I'm not that big on cinema, so I wrote this on my notes. Yeah, a 2000 action movie, spy movie, um, starring Wesley Snipes, Michael Bean, Ann Archer, and Donald Sutherland. So you can check that out. I have not seen it. Um, but the art of war is discussed, and I've heard it a bazillion times, but uh, particularly in Wall Street um, by Michael Douglas, frequency refers to it in winning the game of money. That's what I was talking about, about the psychological aspect, outsmarting um, the economy or the, the stock market as an entity, as the opponent to overcome or threats to the stock market. Um, in the James Bond film, uh, the 20th film, Die Another Day, referenced the art of war as a spiritual guide by Colin Moon. Uh, in The Soprano, season three, um, Dr. Melfi suggests Tony Soprano, he reads the book, The Art of War. In Star Trek, The Next Generation, first season, The Last Outpost, 
uh, William Riker quotes the Art of War to Captain Picard, who expressed pleasure that Sun Tzu had taught what he did. Um, and then we also have it in a handful of other mentions in um, lesser known works, TV shows, um, the TV show Suits. I've seen it referenced to many times when lawyers are looking to outsmart other lawyers. Really, really war is, when we think of war, we think of weapons, murder, killing. We think the Civil War. We think World War One being in the trenches. We think World War Two. We think of Hiroshima. But really, all of the physical uh, weaponry-based action came from strategic planning. So battles, most of the time, were planned. We have the those in the higher ranks, the, the lieutenants and the captains and the the generals and the leaders of certain battalions planning strategy to win the opponent, to minimize casualty um, of their people, to maximize casualty of the opponent's people, to take over regimes, to take over countries. I mean, if you look at what's going on right now with um, Putin and, and Russia and the Ukraine, everything is happening on both ends of strategy and discussion and strategy and discussion planning where to hit what target why how to defend how to defeat how to find this people how to get to this guy it's all psychological mental communicatory um planning and planning takes strategy winning takes strategy you know you can look at war like a game of chess um chess takes skill and strategy if you just know how to move the pieces but don't understand the strategy you're probably never going to win against someone who knows how to really play chess so the art of war is kind of like the guide to planning your actions in military settings and or in um, conflict with opponents. So let's take a look. I have marked some of my favorite passages in here. Um, I think it's brilliant sometimes just to open it and read something. You know, just feel inspired, especially if you're dealing with something you don't like. Really, it, it's a good. Um, so we have the different chapters. We have laying plans waging war, attack by stratagem, tactical dispositions, energy, weak points and strong, maneuvering, variation of tactics, the army on the march, terrain, the nine situations, uh, the attack by fire, and the use of spies, which is one of my favorite chapters. So let's read a little here. Um, so... The Art of War is really known to be one of the most genius pieces of um, antiquity literature. It is very advanced in its line of thinking and the way it was written for the time. We can assume it was written. But anyway, chapter one, we have laying plans. And just to know how Art of War is laid out, you see it's all these just bullet points of knowledge, almost like quotes is how it reads. So it doesn't read so much like a, a novel text kind of a thing. Um, so it talks about moral law, talks about uh, earth, commander's role. Um, so here we have my favorite, all warfare is based on deception. So that's part of the strategy. You need to fool your opponent to get him where you want to get him, to get a leverage, to get the jump on him. It doesn't matter if it's intellectually or physically or um, on a battlefield. Um, we have... If your enemy is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he is superior in strength, go ahead and evade him. Meaning you know that if he's more prepared than you, you're already going to lose. So um, we have lots of advice here. If your opponent is a choleric, choleric temper, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak. So then he may grow arrogant so you can see his weak points. So that's kind of brilliant. I think that might have been one I've heard in one of the movies. So, you know, if you have someone who has an anger management problem, try to calmly and passively get it, get it his irritations until he explodes so you can see where his weak points are. Um, uh, here we have under energy, we have... Sun Tzu said, the control of a large force is the same principle as the control of just a few men. It is merely a question of dividing up the numbers. Um, in all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will need, be needed to secure victory. 
So if you want victory, you have to think more than battle. You have to think outside the box. Um, there are not more than five musical notes, yet the combination of these five give rise to melodies that can never be heard on a battlefield. Fighting with a large army under your command is no wise different than fighting a small one under your command. It's merely a question of instituting signs and signals, paying attention. Um, we have, interesting, over here under weak points and strong points, do not repeat tactics, tactics which have gained you a small victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. So if you get too confident because you won one victory, don't assume that that will work in all situations. Smart advice. So in war, the way to avoid what is strong and to strike, the way to avoid... the blah, blah, blah. So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and to strike at what is weak. Common sense. Um, therefore, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare there are no constant conditions. That is very smart because thing is all, things are always changing. The weather is changing. Uh, the state of the men fighting is changing. The, the status of their um, reserves, like with, you know, gunpowder or sharp blades or whatever they're using, it can be inconsistent. Sometimes there are more weapons, sometimes there are less. The amount of men in a battle are going to be inconsistent. Planning for inconsistency. Um, rouse him and learn the principles of his activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself by rousing him so as to find out his vulnerable spots, which is what I already said. So that kind of is like, Keep your enemies closer than your friends or whatever that quote is. Like, and learn the weak points before you know how to, how to strike or how to get at him or her or to get him where you want him. So I like this uh, one under spies. Sun Tzu said, raising a host of 100,000 men and marching them great distances entails heavy loss on the people and a drain on the resources of the state. The daily expenditure will amount to a thousand ounces of silver. There will be commotion at home and abroad, and men will drop down exhausted on the highways. As many as 700,000 families will be impeded in their labor. So this was really interesting how he foreshadowed the, the misery and damage and effect of war on society and communities. And I think overall Sun Tzu won't, we, it seems reflected in this text to try to avoid war you know it's not something you necessarily want to strive for but if you have to be in it um you need to be the best if you might as well be the one that wins right hostile armies may face each other for years striving for the victory which is decided in one single day this being so, to remain in ignorance of the enemy's condition simply because one grudges the outlay of a hundred ounces of silver in honors and emoluments is the, in, is the height of inhumanity. So, and there's a lot of mention, a mention of inhumanity in here of, of etiquette in battle as well. Um, but then I love the, the bullets about all the different kinds of spies. So we have inward spies making use of officials of the enemy local spies employing the services of the inhabitants of a district converted spies getting hold of the enemy spies and using them for your own purposes that's my favorite having doomed spies doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy surviving spies finally are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp spies cannot be usefully employed without a certain intuitive sagacity uh let's see what else we have here be subtle be subtle be subtle be subtle and use your spies for every kind of business i i think sun tzu really you know valued spies as a tool for getting leverage in battle and i think we still do it to cia you know fbi i mean in government we have spies all over the place to get leverage on the enemy right even law enforcement has spies as as undercover uh, operatives or undercover cops um, 
The end and aim of spying in all its five varieties is knowledge of the enemy, and this knowledge can only be derived in the first instance from the converted spy. Hence, it is essential that the converted spy be treated with the utmost liberality. So treat your spies well. And then we have, you know, how to attack by fire, how to attack by stratagem, the nine situations. Um, you might find yourself in battle. So, for example, in the nine situations, when a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it's a dispersive ground. When he has penetrated into hostile territory, but to no great distance, it is a facile ground. So that gets very complex, but really it's, um, this is interesting, under the Army of the March. Hmm. I've forgotten about that. I haven't read this in quite a while. Um, the Army of the March is proper etiquette when marching um, regiments. So what, what, you know, when you think of using this as a text in uh, West Point or, in, or even our modern military, there's a lot to, I mean, it's not, it's, it's like a, a sort of a collection of, almost like of quotes meant by things you need to memorize, things to do, not to do. And that's so many that it's almost like that, that material has to be put together into some kind of organize, an organized list or lessons because it's just bullet after bullet after bullet of, of advice and meant through these brilliant quotes. Now that's great if you want to insert them if you're a writer or into an essay or take one quote and base uh, a thought process or an action off of it. But overall, it's, it's a lot. But um, it's not the kind of thing you read front to back, really like a novel, because you're just going to forget one ball after another after another. You just pick it up every now and again and read some parts. But if you are doing a class on Asian American literature, or I'm sorry, Asian literature, um, or antiquity literature, or military um, writings in literature, I would highly recommend referring to and using quotes from Art of War and its significance in uh, military literature and or um, in society and different countries and continents because it's a very influential if, piece of writing and it's fascinating to me to read something that old and to think today our militaries are still employing it. So, uh, so there's so much history behind this. If you want to get into how, how it was transcribed and things like that, which I don't want to talk about much longer on this video because it's already going to be so long, but I wanted to recommend it to pick it up. Hopefully that helps you if you're going to write about it. Thank you everybody so much for watching. Keep the, keep your ear out because I have, um, a video coming up with all my leather bound Barnes and Noble pocketbooks and thanks for subscribing. I'll see you again.